members, welcome to our summer symposium on wearable devices. It is our pleasure to invite Mr. Jed Young as our first keynote speaker to share his insights about digital health and beyond. Jack heads up the 100 million Qualcomm Life Fund at Qualcomm Ventures, which was recently ranked as one of the most prolific venture investors in the digital health sector. His investment interests are focused in the area of intersection of healthcare products and services and digital wireless technologies. Prior to Qualcomm, Jack was the executive vice president and U.S. country manager at ZTE, who helped establish the company's U.S. market presence. Jack earned a master's degree in electrical engineering from University of Calgary and an MBA from McGill University. Please give a welcome, warm welcome to Mr. Jack Young. Well, it's, it's a great honor to be here with Casper. I know some of you probably went to uh, Simicon West, so probably, I don't know if you caught, I was a speaker there as well, so if you've seen it, feel free to check the score. And, um, so wearable is certainly one of the most interesting uh, buzzwords here, right? So um, certainly we are talking today about the application, but I want to open up a little bit, just talk about some of the drivers, why wearable is interesting, why at this junction, it's possible, right? So this is basically um, the area that I've been spending a lot of time in. So the first thing is uh, I was introduced as an investor in digital health. And um, uh, in health, uh, it's, it's a very interesting global phenomenon. So the first thing that you see is the life, life expectancy, as you imagined, right, over the years has improved. Back in 96, uh, back, back in 1950s, uh, the life expectancy is shy, just below 60, and now obviously it's much higher. So people live longer. The other problem we have globally phenomenal is the, the fertility rate is dropping rapidly. Again, back in 1950s, the fertility rate is about four, and today it's about two, right? So obviously many of us uh, have a Chinese heritage that we know what happened in China, that uh, the population uh, that trending old um, so, so, so the population is rapidly shifting, right? So what happened is, if you look at it, uh, in the United States, I don't know if you recall this, every single day, about 10,000 people turn 65 or older, right? Because the baby booming generation. So what happened is, as the population gets older, the available caretakers proportionally reduce, right? So think about the younger people uh, going to the workforce and you have to take care of all the older people. So that becomes a, a global challenge, not only in the U.S., but also global phenomenal. So as a result, many believe the only way to do it is through some kind of technology innovation. So some of the stuff we talked about exactly try to address some of those issues. Um, just kind of, a, 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 I, I call this thing about, you know, talking about the, the older people, why it matters uh, that uh, there was a, a news about a year and a half ago was a Japanese diaper maker, right? So making diapers. They said for the first time last year, their sales, there's some apple, right? The sales uh, of their adult diaper exceed the inf sales of an infant diaper. Now think about it, that's a pretty sad story, right? So certainly we're not gonna get there, but uh, that's the, so, so why that matter? So the matter is that as the population getting older, what, the, what causes the health care system is essentially it's the people has multiple chronic disease. So typically the high correlation to, you know, the 5% of people spend 45% of the expenditures. So those are the people who have the multiple chronic diseases, right? Diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And then if you look at the population where 65 and older, people tend to have one or more. So essentially, I'm obviously here blame the seniors, so we're all gonna get there, right? So it's okay to, to start with that. But the, the point here is that obviously as the population getting older, especially in an industry na uh, nation like ours in China, for example, that we're going to have a huge problem in our system. So if we, we're not going to do anything, obviously going to drive everybody bankrupt. But if we were to do something, the best the, the device we have is obviously in the technology. So lots of things are starting with a cell phone, right? So, so why cell phone is it's mostly suited for 
uh, the health. So, so if you think about it, many of us work in the city semiconductor industry. So if you take a cell phone and take it apart, you'll see lots of semiconductor uh, 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 sensors, right? Uh, MAM sensors, other high sensors. So suddenly, accelerometers and gyros are well used, and there are people are finding using other sensors for other unconventional uses. For example, uh, Bluetooth is being used to locate people and whether you go into certain locations. But the cell phone, the other thing is, beyond these sensors built in, it's also bring the entire network with you, right? So your people are always on the cell phone, you check how well your parents are doing, we are checking how popular we are on Facebook and Twitter, right? So, so that's kind of the thing that the, the people today are basically bringing your phone 150 times. I actually didn't count, but I bet you there's an application you can count how many times you use your cell phone, but I bet you it's right up there. So the first wave is these companies are coming out is that imagine when Apple first came out with these sensors, it wasn't intent for these applications, but people quickly figure out, hey, if I got a GPS, what if I use that GPS instead of just doing navigation, I can track my run, right? See how, how what the miles and the speed went out. And people like me are using it in ski, in my ski runs, so I keep on trying to break my my speed, which is pretty dangerous. But the people are doing that, and then quickly that people realize these sensors can be also to use to build wearables, the first generation wearables are very much built on the very sensors that we have in a cell phone. So I want to ask how many people are wearing one of those wearables today? Whoa, that's pretty mute. That's surprising. I'm an investor in a Fitbit. Do me a favor, go buy some. <laughs> but, so here, obviously, the wearables you have to try. So there's numerous examples I want to talk about a little bit later. So, so the first thing that we see in the, in the space, uh, I think wearable is part of the overall theme of connected devices and IOTs. So if you think about in your cabinets, you probably some people have one of those devices, either you or you know, your elderly or kids, you know, uh, you know, people are using uh, the blood pressure cuff or a glucometer or inhalers. These devices have been along in home use for 20, 30 years. So if you look at the last 20, 30 years, really nothing changes that much. It's getting a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit more user friendly, but all of a sudden, Last couple of years, we've seen just every manufacturer, every uh, companies out there are putting these devices connected, right? So there's a famous word said, everybody on the network. So imagine every device is gonna be, human device is gonna be connected on the, on the, on the network. And Samsung obviously famously said a couple of uh, uh, months ago, voice of the body, right? So what it, that means is that with these devices, now we have an opportunity to measure these things pretty much in real time, just like you all tweeting, your Facebook updating, your body is sending these messages, whether, you, whether to your loved one, to yourself, or to a machine, or to a caretaker. So what we see is the existing medical industry, there's a huge innovation going on, largely centered around how do we turn this device to become a connected devices, and through that, how we change the way how we engage the patient, and how ultimately deliver better care. So while that's happening, because the advance in semiconductor and sensors, all the things that we talked about, and also the availability of the cell phone as a, a generic computing devices, people are starting to bring these things otherwise not available in the palms of somebody's hand. So a good example, again, is a company called AliveCore. Some of you probably uh, have gone through the episode or your parents have gone through the episode whereby you have a irreg irregular heartbeat, we call arrhythmia, right? So the way to detect that is to wearing a device called a Holter device pretty much like the one I'm wearing today. It's not very comfortable, but you're wearing that for 24 hours or 48 hours, and hopefully you can catch a symptom where you can show a irregularity of your heart and the doctors can prescribe certain devices or uh, treatment to, to treat that. Now imagine the heartbeat ir irregularity is really hard to catch because if you have a severe symptom, you probably end in the hospital. But for these people that periodically have demonstrated a symptom, a 48 hours is not necessarily enough to do that. And if you do, so what? You know, how do we see your your treatment is uh, is your, your heart rate is, uh, rhythms are reacting to the treatment that doctor prescribed you? So here's a company basically taking advantage of all the modern cell phone provided, right? So big battery, a display, and the connectivity to the doctor. So what they did, is, unfortunately I didn't bring a sample here, but essentially made a case, where in the back of the case there are two electrodes that you can acquire a single strip, uh, a two lead ECG right there, right? So you can see 
for your eyes, obviously most people are not not uh, uh, certified to read that way, but essentially that can be sent to a machine, IBM Watson for example, right? Or your doctors can take a look at it. So if you're, whether it's for screening, early detection, or continuing monitoring for that, that becomes a possible, again, largely to the system, thanks to the sensors and devices. Now, that very devices are now being ported to wearables, right? You probably, again, reference to Samsung, they talk about this device called SimBand. SimBand is basically a, a, a development platform one of the things they talked about is not only measuring the heart rate, but also actually getting your ECGs. So starting with the cell phones, again, quickly migrate to, to, uh, to a wearable space. And, um, uh, you know, again, wearable is certainly one of the area that it's, uh, it's, it's talked about in IoT. But the other thing is that how do we do things without least intrusion, right? So for example, I actually give up my watch to wear those things. It's great for me because instead of paying $10,000 every two years, I'm getting this one for free. So follow. Uh, uh, but, the, but the thing is that there are lots of devices out there. You can actually, uh, without you know, intrude your, your daily routines, you can get some, uh, some uh, information about it. For example, I mentioned earlier that people like ourselves, right? Pulling out the phones 150 times, and during that time, we do all kinds of things, whether we call our friends, sending text messages, or check certain applications. So, if you follow that addiction that we have, and if you can monitor that, that pretty much tells you about mental status, right? Imagine that if you have a depression, chances are you're going to suffer a social contraction if you go into the episode. That's exactly what a company does, Ginger IO, for example, one of those companies, just by monitoring. How often you engage your phone, what kind of application you use, and monitor your social activity, pretty much can predict whether you're going to go through one of those episodes. And as many studies suggested, depression and chronic disease patients, uh, 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 there's lots of comorbidity between the two. So by monitoring that, we can save the, uh, the, the health industry lots of money. So again, the wearable is another dimension that imagine you pull out your phone 120 times, 150 times, the wearable is with you all the time, right? So the information you're given, it's a lot more richer and continuous. So there's other way, there's actually there's gonna be many other companies that try to tap into that data stream to figure out what exactly to do. Uh, the other thing is uh, happening at the same time is the so-called ambient intelligence. So instead of wearing those devices, what about these sensors built in, right? So I, I caught on the Facebook uh, yesterday, uh, and this company actually listed here, that is, they are, uh, forming a relationship with a company called Misfit, which is one of the better known wearables. So they actually uh, are selling these bed sensors put underneath your mattress. So for people having a sleeping uh, uh, issues, there's one way to monitor that. But another really good tool, a use case, which I always talked about is, what if you have your mom and your dad living alone at home, right? If you won't put one of those devices under the mattress, monitor that data longitudinally, right? To how often they get off the bed, the heart rate and respiratory can tell you a lot and probably save the, the elderly from an emergency uh, room. At Qualcomm, we have a long history uh, looking how do we integrate these things, application processes. One of the areas I myself and my colleagues spent lots of time just scouting the world to see what are the next generation sensors. So people asking what, the, what would be the uh, uh, next wearable looks like. I guess the next word was as good as the congregation of these sensors, right? Because that's the first indication. If these sensors are become useful, like the accelerometers and gyros, and become you know power friendly, all the things, then there's an opportunity putting into the wearables. So if you look at the wearable we know today, whether it's a Fitbit, a uh, 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 Misfit, as it's basically it's taking the components was made for cell phones, right? So that's why it's kind of bulky. It's not probably not the the most user friendly. It's because not designed for wearable, but we see obviously rapidly it's changing. We see lots of companies that are working on these sensors. So here's just some examples, right? So people are working on gas, uh, and, you know, sensors are detected gas. So imagine if I can monitor your your breath, right? Well, they tell you whether you you have too much alcohol, or you just tell people, right, it's time to go have a clean your orally, right? So so there there is these sensors out there since we are taking the phone all the time. I mean, the wear devices can monitor air quality. Obviously, in China, that'll be a big population. The sensors out there can analyze in real time your sweat, the sweat components, which take tell you whether you know you're dehydrated or you are you know time to take a rest or 
you know, you probably need to take some sugar pills in certain cases. So these sensors are available, so they're basically attached to your skin to do this real time. And we have seen other sensors that basically monitor other movements. For example, iris is one of the areas that people can use that for authentication or can use for other things. And the other is we've seen as a flexible, a flexible and bendable electronics. So here I show an example of this company called MC10. Look it up. It's almost futuristic. So what they said is they can put the sensor tattoo your, to your body, right? So they make the electronics, uh, the circuit board and the electronics bendable and stretchable. So that's your ultimate wearable. So if you leave the hospital, doctors say, hey, let me just stamp on you for a couple of days and you can wear it off. Uh, so that's the ultimate wearable in my, in, my, in my mind. So many of you have seen this, right? So wearable is posing a huge opportunity for all of us working in this industry. Cell phones obviously reaches the saturation. Smartphones, six billion devices. And many believe, right, it's going to be 20 billion of these wearables, everybody's going to have multiple devices, whether it's uh, tattooed to your body, implant, or it's you're wear, wearing it. Uh, uh, but lots of these applications are starting with, uh, on this activity trackers is basically the first area, right? So one thing that people see is that, you know, smartphones, obviously, as we know today, is kind of a standardized form factor we know. There's probably going to be some changes here and there, but it's pretty much kind of a, you know, the candy ball format is taking hold. But the wearables are, are pretty much are still in the nascency, right? People ask me, where is wearable today? I say, well, this is kind of like a Blackberry a couple years ago, right? We, all, we don't know where it's going to go, and we know it's going to the right direction, but there's probably multiple directions are going to go, right? The activity tracker is certainly the things that we know today. I'm using that. I try to do a 12,000 steps every day, and it's really working for me. And other people, it's going to be a, a communication and productivity extension. So this, this will be a, a, your second display, so you can take a quick look at it. I can see the score if I want to uh, in the future. And uh, the other thing I mentioned about all the the drivers behind all those applications and sensors become available, that can be really using for medical purposes, more than just tracking activity, track your heart rate, your ECG, your sweat, all kinds of things that doctors potentially will prescribe that devices that you can wear at your convenience. The other thing is people also complain is these wearables, uh, my friend Sunny Wu at the Misfit famously said, the wearables are designed by the silicon engineers, Silicon Valley engineers, and wear by the Silicon Valley nerds, right? So, so think about it. People really, especially summertime, you know, lots of uh, people come to me, hey, is there a better one instead of wearing this plastic getting old? So I think this is happening. One direction is going to be fashion devices. It's going to be built in your clothes, by right? Instead of wearing these clunky things that become fashionable again. So, so I think the wearable is going to take all those directions where it's going to be. Uh, it, it's yet to be determined. Uh, lots of people are batting an apple to set that, that, that standard, but I think it's really hard for any devices to encompass all those, right? Cost point, fashion statement, functionalities, and, uh, and clinical benefits. So, so if you look at what happened is last couple years, because all the things happening, right? All the examples are given to you, essentially everything that we know, it's become quantifiable, right? So whether it's disease management, monitoring your blood sugar, blood pressure, heart rate, or for your wellness that measures you know, the steps you're doing, the calorie you're doing. Everything has become available. From head to toe, just about anything, if you want to measure today, you can get one. If you don't have one, feel free to start one and kickstart it, right? So, so everything is there. So the challenges that I mentioned earlier, this has become lots of noise. What are you going to do with that kind of information, right? So. People, most people are starting this, let's just do it, right? That's, that's how Twitter and Facebook started, right? People just toss all kinds of things in the ether and somebody eventually will figure out how to use it, how to connect it together. That's where industry exactly is moving next. So we're seeing the first wave is all the devices, whether it's new, or the old ones or new ones, all become connected. The next thing we're seeing in the last couple months, well, last couple of years, there's an industry-wide effort to aggregate this data, right? To organize these data. So instead of you know, this data is sent this way and this data is sent this way. People are trying to build this personalized hub, right? Qualcomm, for example, we have an initiative called Qualcomm Hub. But most recently, if you see Apple and Google is coming back to this area, right? What they try to do is build a personal archive so all the devices or the application you use can go to one place instead of you go to Fitbit, check the, check the steps, and then you go to Wising, check your weight. There's other places you can do it all together. Once we put the data together, 
what the next opportunity is obviously everybody's favorite buzzword is called big data, right? So what does the big data do in health? There's lots we can do. The big, th the good thing is, in the consumer health and the health health that they are, these data is already available. For example, every time we go see a doctor, there's a record of EMR, right? It's locked in. Doctors taking those, they're not looking at you. They're busy taking those because the government told them they have to do. But these data is out there. And the claims data is that insurance company knows exactly the procedures, how much it costs for that procedures, and your recovery time is, et cetera. And uh, these data are become available. It's already available for years, right? And also the consumer data, where you eat and how healthy you are, and so, and so on and so forth. And lots of people obviously today are very expressive talking about the diseases and conditions on social media. You probably heard about people, sites like Patient Like Me, people are sharing information about how they you know, uh, react to certain treatments. So those people are talking things on, on the social networks. And lastly, we talked about, you know, uh, uh, this connected devices pushing all this new data into this mix, right? Uh, actually, one more thing is genomics is coming that my one of my favorite subjects, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, is that the genomics, the sequencing, is becoming cheaper and cheaper. So if you put all this data together, right? We know your, your, your history, we know your real-time behavior, we know your family histories, but then there's an opportunity to reach a much, much inside. So now my point is, leading to this point is, what I try to talk about, the device is just the beginning, right? That's just taking the data, tracking your activities, contribute to this mix. And this data can mix it with other data and generate much, much more insights. Then you can do something about it. So if I just do these data, it's meaningless, it's just tech talk, right? So unless I can change your behavior, if I'm wearing wearables, the Fitbit, I'm still sitting on the couch, I'm only doing 3,000 steps, it's not gonna help me, but unless I can make the behavior changes. So making human behavior changes is a really, really difficult thing to do, but at least now there's an opportunity that to make it personalized, right? So some people obviously react to you know, games, you know, some people like to games, if I give you some points, maybe you, 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 you're willing to do trading your steps for, uh, uh, for points, other people are very given, so you can link that to uh, uh, you know charity events. Others, you know, maybe more related to a direct incentive. So if your insurance company says, "Hey, guess what? You know, do me a favor, wear that Fitbit, and if you can, you know, demonstrate me, you do ten dollars steps on average for thirty days, we give you a reduced or co-payment." Or they can say, "Hey, if you connect to your scales, the info proof that I know you have red, losing certain pounds or blood pressures or not." I can give you uh, some kind of uh, uh, coupons that you towards you know other healthy behaviors. So uh, these mechanisms are being available, right? So you know whether it's a big data analytics, which we can borrow from the e-commerce and social media, or to all the things that how people react to online, that can be used to making these behavior changes. Now the key is all started. The data has become available, whether it's through a wearable, through a mobile phone, or you use the self-input data. Once you mix this data together, there's an opportunity. So, uh, kind of a summarize it. So, what you see in the last couple of years, six, seven years, is that we see the ecosystem starting with mobilize the data, right? Whether it's you know old data, old devices, new again, adding connectivity, or the new devices I mentioned coming online, native with a, a built-in sensors and connectivity, moving to the second phase, which is get data organized, right? So I mentioned about the, the Google, uh, the Apple, and Qualcomm. The next thing is obviously taking advantage of what we know in the big data to process that data stream. And lastly is that hopefully we can make a change, change to your personal behavior, change to the overall system, how doctors and patients engage, and ultimately uh, demonstrate there is a cost benefit. Right? So unless we can see this uh, uh, working, uh, if we were to see this working, which is obviously clearly that we're going to continue to see these cycles, right? We're going to see more sensors, more wearables, and hence a better and better result. I think that's pretty clear to me. Um, kind of change the subject a little bit. So obviously, lots of people work in Silicon Valley will say, "Well, this is all good." Where? How about the venture investors uh, uh, react to that? So one of the area, the wearable, is the first wearable uh, being tracked. It's sort of in the, the mix of the digital health, right? Digital health company are working in all those buckets I mentioned earlier, whether it's organized data, big data analytics, or the device device side, all the sensors. So this area has been a very hot. Uh, last year, is about two billion dollars invested in these companies and this year six months into that we already have a 2.3 billion dollars and one of the 
the, Will talked about uh, the, uh, the digital house company went public, a company called Cast Light. If you look into that, the company essentially sort of a set a record. Uh, last year they had about $30 million in revenue, and this year they're gonna double, triple that, but they are traded at about $1.2 billion. Some people say, well, that's phenomenal, right? And uh, many companies uh, in areas in wearables or other area I talked about have raised lots of capital in this area. And some of the companies obviously, because uh, they're less consumer driven, uh, probably less known, but company like you know Fitbit, for example, has raised between fifty to hundred million dollars, and their company has raised about you know even more than one hundred fifty million dollars. For example, uh, I mentioned these companies. Um, so, interestingly, um, so that lots of money went into that, and I said this is a, a still a, a fairly new area, right? So, so it kind of you know, do a quick calculation. I know this is kind of a complicated bit, but basically if you follow me here, that I, my job as a venture capitalist is based on uh, my returns, right? Certainly in my investors probably expecting a 20% IR. So if you do that calculation, essentially the $4 billion we invested in that company, that the industry is expecting a uh, $30 billion by 2019 to achieve that benchmark. Certainly we have a long way, long way to go. Uh, I won't bore you this detail. So, so let me talk a little bit about these, you know, this wearables and digital health. And it's kind of, you know, I've been investing in this area for seven years, and you know, we talked about, you know, areas are happening everywhere. So the question is, where are we going to go from here, right? So what is the next things beyond those wearables and devices? So I want to highlight a few areas, which is personally, I'm starting to build a thesis. In fact, that we're making investment into that. So hopefully, give you a glimpse of what's going on to the next wave. So number one is I believe the genomics. I mentioned earlier the cost of sequencing is is going down dramatically, right? So ten years ago, twelve years ago, the first human was sequenced cost almost a billion dollars, one point two billion dollars, and the human actually lives in, in in San Diego. But today you pretty much can do a sequencing about a thousand dollars. So if you look at a cost performance curve, famously with Intel. Intel campus, right? The, the, the Moore's law, the, the actually the sequencing, human sequencing performance, cost performance outperform the Moore's law. So which means that you are, you're going to see a, a huge reduction of cost and performance in terms of uh, doing uh, a, a whole genome sequencing. So wh what, why does that matter? The matter is it's going to be a huge implication to just about everything we, did, we know about in medical, right? So one of the most po uh, popular uh, uh, Obviously, is so-called a personalized medicine. So if I don't know if you know the stats, which is kind of shocking to me, is that today, you know, most of the drugs from beginning to finish cost about one billion dollars to develop, right? Whatever the drugs we've gone through, FDA as clinical trials. But if you calculate all the drugs failed, it's actually cost four billion dollars. Now, what happened that trial during the trial is doing a small sample of people. They did it so many thousand people, and they went to FDA and said, "Well, look, we have this correlation." Please give us approval, so hence we can go on to recuperate the three, four billion dollars we just invested. The result is that it's basically drugs is designed for all, right, for all population. So as a result, what we're seeing is 25 percent of people have side effect or negative effect, and then 12 percent of the people has no response. Now imagine a drug, a doctor give it to you, has less than, has more than 30 percent, you know, either negative effect or no effect. In any industry, it's not going to happen, right? So if you were to be going to, you know, let's say a retail store and says, hey, I want this, and they say, here's one thing you have, and by the way, 30% is going to fail. Who's going to buy that? But this is how it's going to be, it's done today. The sequencing is one of those things that can potentially dramatically improve that efficacy. By knowing you and knowing your family history, that now for the first time that we can closely correlate it to how certain people react to those drugs. Now, it's not going to, get into a 100% response because there are many other things that we're here to, dis uh, to expose. But the bottom line is the 30% failure rate, it's not going to be acceptable right, in order to, to make changes. So I think the, 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 the sequencing is the next thing that will basically going to be hugely change how the drugs are prescribed to you and how you're going to be uh, treated. So that's one of the biggest things I think it's going to happen. So next month, next week, we are making our first investment in genomics, so stay tuned, take a look at it, it'll be announced sometime next week. And the second thing I think is, uh, 
it's a huge of uh, human body augmentation, right? So if you recall, uh, I mentioned about cardiac uh, arrhythmias, and people have these plantable pacemakers. So if your heart can't keep up the rhythm, you basically sense an electrical pulse to keep it up. And that's, by the way, it started about you know, 50, 60 years ago, right? The first human was implanted in 1958. So when people are talking about all kinds of implantable electronics, right? The, this perpetual talks about artificial pancreas as a penicillin, as a cure for people who have diabetic. And these things are obviously happen, and then obviously uh, people are using uh, uh, these processes for, for a long time. And Dean Kamen, for example, is one of the uh, uh, designer for the Segways that came out with this device called Look Arm. Essentially, it's gentle enough, able to pick up a grape, right? Flip a quarter. <laughs> That's a very huge. So I think what happened is, you're going to see these kind of things that human augmentation, as I say, all of us are getting older, all our devices, our organs probably are in the trajectory of decay. There's an opportunity actually using devices, wearables to, to improve that. The next thing is that it's actually already happened right now is a 3D printing of organ, right? So we talked about 3Ds being using printing all those plastic, you know, hobby objects. But here is an opportunity that actually you can build a scaffold and use your stem cell or donor cells to actually print uh, an organ. This is already been used in the clinical, right? So there are people out there that with a windpipe, which is the first example, that de facto, some girls actually born without a windpipe, the scientists or the doctors was able to print that windpipe and insert it, and then people survive to that. That's truly amazing right now. Imagine that if you keep on working that, there's an opportunity to really make whatever the organs of your, of your, of your, of your desire. So um, kind of last one, just kind of a, a self-promotion here that I work in Qualcomm Ventures and Qualcomm Life Fund. So we are a pretty uh, active investor in this area. I, mean, uh, I think we mentioned earlier that you know, we're certainly are looking for applications and uh, working with industry together to push this area all, uh, forward. Uh, in our portfolio, we have a company directly related to wearable, for example, Fitbit is one, and then we have other devices and applications. WellTalk is, for example, the company I mentioned earlier is basically creating incentive and uh, catalyze changes. So, anyways, uh, I appreciate your time. I, I know it's a Saturday afternoon, so.